Can I? Okay. okay. All right. All right. Um, hi. Um, so my name is Yulin. Um, and I prepared this talk for some conferences actually. But yeah, so reason why I talk about Agile AI because I'm a Scrum Master and I'm a data scientist. So I joined the AI company about three months ago and they need somebody to basically um, make their processes more agile because they're a startup and they really um, need some help structuring their projects and stuff like that. Right. So, yep, let's take a look. So, uh, so a little bit about AI and a little bit about Agile. AI began like long time ago. It's like in since the 1945, right? And basically, even back then, they have conferences in the 1950s. There's like conferences uh, for AI. And basically, all these uh, scientists came up with all sorts of different ideas, um, neural networks, uh, all this technology, even back then. And we all know about Alan Turing, right? And um, his theory of um, of 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 uh, what do you call it? The, the Turing machine and stuff like that. So it's not new. The reason why now it's becomes such a boom is because technology has caught up with the theory, right? Now we have the technology to actually support uh, what AI can do, what the theory can do. So for agile, agile started in the nineteen nineties, right? This is when um, software become uh, become the in thing, become something that people will buy, will purchase, right? And and during the 1990s, this is when uh, people realized that you know software as a product can become so big, so cumbersome, take so long to produce that it doesn't become profitable, right? That it becomes um, something that people don't want to buy. So that's when Agile comes in and basically make it into a, to, to capture it as a product that is uh, lean, that is small enough that people will actually buy it, right? So that is the, the cost behind producing a software uh, make it, to make it uh, cheaper. Okay, so just to take a look at the timeline, Right, so very quickly, we're just within five years. All these companies basically um, has incorporated AI in their systems, right? And basically, back in the back in two thousand sixteen, I believe so they did a survey of asking um, companies. Uh, they did a survey on all the companies, and basically, sixty percent of the companies actually said that they want to become, they want to use AI by twenty eighteen. And now it's 2018, not sure how many of those 60 companies actually incorporated AI, but yeah, there you go. And same thing with the Agile trend. So if you look since uh, 2005, that's almost like non, not heard of, right? And now, basically, this is basically all the jobs that uh, require an Agile, Agile software development uh, in their jobs. So if you notice now, it's like 30% of all the jobs scope uh, requires Agile, yeah. So for Agile, this is what people think Agile is. Short, simple, but in actual fact, that's what Agile is like. It's very complicated, right? It's four values and 12 principles. Anything that has 12 principles is not simple in my book, right? 12, oh goodness. And Bible only has 10 commandments. Okay, so for Machine learning systems, these are the things we want to take into account. These are the things they want to take into account when coming up with a, a productionized uh, machine learning systems. So we want to have data quality. We want to have uh, good performance. We want to have model quality, maintainability of your system as well as your data, monitoring and alerting, basic monitoring of the output, uh, the, uh, the accuracy, prediction, and all that, and alerting if there's any errors, whether there's any um, outliers, and security and reliability is the last, but not the least, right? So, yep. Um, three things I will talk about uh, in my coming slides, which is basically the three pillars of Scrum. Uh, if you be careful, you'll notice uh, where it comes in. But so the three things that, uh, 
the three pillars are adaptation, basically responding to change, inspection, review of your processes as well as your codes and your uh, models, and transparency, basically documentation, communicating with people, communication with people, with uh, the business as well as your team members. Yep. And these are the three things I'll talk about. All right. So a quick comparison. Okay, so this is our traditional waterfall model. This is the uh, Chris DM model. So the Chris DM model, basically, you have your business understanding, data understanding, and then you do data preparation, do your modeling, evaluation, and employment. You see the similarities there? If we can change the waterfall model into an HR model, we can do the same for the data science Chris DM model. Okay, so this is um, pretty much the typical, uh, this is just an example, sorry, it's not typical, it's an example of an agile, uh, AI system, right? So in the sense where I use the MV, uh, MVC uh, model, uh, sorry, structure here. So the thing is that whatever you come up with, right, you do your data, you do your features, you do your modeling, you come up with an AI model. This is, a, let's say this is an iteration, now you come up with iteration one, iteration three, right? Your AI model that you come up with, it really, it takes up only a very small segment of your entire architecture, your software architecture. Doesn't mean that they don't do a, uh, a lot of work. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, but the output of the model is it's small comparison to the rest of your software architecture. And same thing, it could be in a model, it could be in a controller. It depends on your system. Okay, so the issue with going with the traditional ChrisDM model, Chris model, you have lack of clarity, lack of planning. It's a blind handoff. Basically, you just hand it off, pass it to the software engineer, and that's it. You do whatever you need with this model, right? I maybe give you an API, and that's it. Failure to iterate, right? So these are the four key things that basically uh, most of the traditional uh, models lack. It's quite similar to uh, the waterfall, uh, lacks of the waterfall model. Okay, so let's take a look at the agile iteration. So this is a typical uh, agile software iteration. Uh, basically, within each it, this each iteration, you should have all of these, right? You should have um, planning. Uh, you should have meetings to plan, design, then you deliver, develop, you test it, and then you evaluate. That's your typical Agile uh, life cycle. Okay, so it's very important to plan, right? If you don't plan, basically you're just uh, asking for trouble. Anything that you don't plan for is hard to make it uh, make the project a success. So planning is very important. So when we plan for an Agile, sorry, for an AI um, AI project, what do we do? We state the hypothesis. It's very important. So. It's quite it's coming quite common nowadays when you know when where the newer generations they like to go and join a hackathon, they like to just take a data set of Kaggle, what they do, they don't even state the hypothesis. They straight away they jump in and they, they play with it, come out and that's it. But when you want to productionize the system, this becomes um, very important that you actually first state the hypothesis. Make sure that you actually uh, moving towards the correct goal. You're actually solving the problem that is meant to be solved. Do a design and implementation of, uh, implement of your metrics. This is uh, basically implement the metrics first, which is what we call the TDD form of uh, going uh, for AI. Basically, first implement the metrics before you actually implement your model. Design for it. That, that forces you to design. Think about what are the useful metrics to use. Reevaluate and redesign. Those are key things that uh, I think is very important. I'll show you uh, how uh, what I mean later on in terms of the overall structure. Okay. So when we talk about MVP, this here this is uh, two different definitions of the MVP. Um, so the common. Uh, Common mindset of MVP is the second one. Right. Eric Ries MVP basically is the 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 smallest uh, workable software for you to be able to go out there and test your system. 
to test the user's response. So that's uh, Eric Ries' uh, idea of MVP. Now, the, an earlier definition of MVP comes from Robinson. And that, that's when, uh, to, in 2001, where software uh, still comes out of a box. It's not through the internet. They haven't started selling uh, software through the internet. It's basically you, you have to buy a CD to be able to install your software. Right? And back then, that means that you have to make sure that the product you come up with is sellable, that people actually want it. Right? So for him, an MVP is the right size of product that is big enough to basically allow for adoption of your software to have satisfaction of customers, and to the most key important thing, to have sales, right? To be able to justify the amount of effort you have put into creating that software. So if you look at this here, right? So what this means is that for Eric Ries, we look at it, I look at it as the small, small iterations. You can use that as your Eric Ries definition of MVP. And for the big circle here, make sure you look at Robinson's definition of MVP. Both are very important, right? Especially when it comes to uh, AI uh, project, where if you start, if you only look at the small picture, you lose sight of the big picture. Okay, so what I want to do is basically I want to shift this model, this uh, traditional Christian model, into something slightly different. So we take the important parts. Uh, the data understanding, data preparation, the modeling, and the deployment. We take those, and we put in the business understanding and evaluation in each iteration. Okay? Similarly, we put in the planning and testing in each iteration. This allows us to basically make sure that we have, uh, we have good understanding of the product and what we want to do right good planning and each of the each and every step right this is when we can adapt without this we won't know we don't do reviews we can't really adapt at each stage okay so if there's any change in the data if there's any change to the customer um, use case we can uh, we can actually respond to it similarly we bring in the agile iteration we also have to Make sure that we do the planning, the designing, the development, the testing, and the evaluation at each and every stage. Okay, so what do I look at? Look at this as your small circle. So first, don't dive deep. Don't do your whole project at one go. No. First, do high-level and data analytics. Analysis, sorry. High-level data analysis, and then generate your model, your validation, and straight away integrate. What this means is that don't aim for 90% uh, accuracy at the first go. Right? Set your target. Make sure it's an achievable target. As soon as you just meet the target, integrate first. After you've done that, then only you do feature engineering. Okay? Then only you do model tuning and validation. And then, make sure you have your model serving pipeline state. Okay? So what this does is that it breaks it down and basically makes sure that you don't do all these six things at one go. You do it in stages. Okay. Next, we want to look at review. So these are all the things that you can review at every stage, right? Always keep reviewing, review the individuals, interactions between your team members, customer feedback, your processes, the tools, and the plan, especially the plan. Always uh, feel free to adapt your plan, change your plan. Okay, and tools are very, very important, right? Review your tools. What tools are you using? If you're not using any of the tools at first round, maybe your second round you can include them, uh, you can include them right? So, one of the tools I found out, as uh, you mentioned, you're talking about testing, right? So, testing for AI um, algorithms, typically it means you have to write the metrics, right? You have to write the metrics so that uh, all your different models will use the same metrics, generate the same output. 
And I find that there's a few pipeline tools out there, what I call pipeline tools, Kubeflow, MLflow, and a couple others, um, uh, such as pipeline AI, and so on and so forth. These tools, they help you basically, um, basically put together all your different metrics from your different models. So you just need to, uh, it's just some tool frameworks that for you to uh, basically put it on one page, your output basically sends to send your output somewhere and basically on one page you can see your different models uh, metrics. Okay, and other tools of course make sure that you have all your different uh, machine learning framework tools. R Studio is great, I love R Studio especially if you're just doing initial uh, exploration. Just go with a simple, um, simple tool like that, right? Do your exploration first, make sure that you're aligned with your customer align with the business before you dive deep. And there's really, there's tons of tools out there. Um, it's still in the early stages, so all these tools may not be mature, but it's very promising. So, and that's where we, uh, we evaluate our tools, right? We come in and evaluate our tools as well. Okay. So next, when you put engineers and data scientists together, what do you get? Anybody? <laughs> what? Okay. Actually, yeah. Um, they pretty much they don't talk. <laughs> and that's a bad thing. So this is key for a job, basically communication, right? Your engineers need to talk to your scientists and your scientists need to talk to your engineers. This communication basically it comes in for any agile methodologies up there, even for DevOps, right? It's very key for the scientists to understand the goals of the engineers and the engineers to understand what the data scientists can achieve. Then only you can have a successful AI project. Okay, so that's about it. I'll leave you with this last one. Planners and doers. Right, so we need both planners and doers. And the best thing is that, so the planners need to learn from the doers and the doers need to learn from the planners, right? And the best thing is the planners, basically they become the best doers and the doers, they actually become the best planners out there. All right, I'll leave that. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, definitely a lot uh, of, uh, there's a lot of other options, basically a lot of other ways you can do it. But yes, we have done Scrum. Uh, we are doing Scrum, we do weekly Scrum actually. So basically all, all the cycles you see there is per week. So that we can actually churn things out fast. Any other questions? What are some of the challenges that you should look out for when you are performing this Scrum? Um, the challenges is actually the, it's quite similar to uh, what your modern uh, software uh, software company or team actually faces. So, yeah, your typical um, basically uh, refuse to change, uh, refuse to adopt new processes. Yeah, those are quite typical. It there's no change uh, difference there. Yeah. Uh, are, you many, uh, are you handling many projects at once or yep. focus on like one project? You mean the team members? Uh, I mean, yeah. Or for as everyone a scrum master? Involved. For everyone involved. Everyone involved, yeah. So focus is one of the have focus. So that means one project at one time. Does an agile framework work if let's say the team members are like spread across like two or three projects? Typically, that means less efficiency because you have no focus. Yeah. Sorry. How do you see the, the practice of agile AI right now? You showed the, the graph for yep. agile and the graph for AI. Yep. So what is the, the current state of practice for agile AI? 
Oh, it's, it's getting quite popular, actually. I'm not the only one doing this, that's for sure. When I did my research uh, coming out with this topic, yeah, that's, I actually borrowed for quite a few people out there. So if you just Google, there are some blogs. So, the, the, I mean, the, there is a lot of talk about AI recently in the Definitely. years, I would yep. say. Um, like, how many percentage of that do you think they are actually doing agile AI? Uh, Percentage-wise, very little, I would say. It's still a new concept, it's still a new idea, and AI itself is still new, so we are still exploring. Like, all the tools that I show out there, most of them are really quite new. Yeah, but which has session, with a session with our studio, but yeah, the rest are actually quite new. So we are still exploring. So there's still lots of room to grow, but the trend is heading there. Yes. So any software nowadays, in order for us to keep that business advantage, right? You probably need to incorporate some AI in some way or another. So it's it's not just for software companies, for non-software as well, for banks, finance, um, even typical. Uh, what you call it, manufacturing, they also have AI, yes, everywhere. Yes? Okay. What are the common roadblocks and pitfalls in implementing like Scrum, like this Scrum, like this Scrum methodology for like small AI teams? Or like in like those, or in like those companies that which are looking to adopt Scrum as a methodology in their AI projects? Pitfalls, um, it's hard to say because um, each situation is quite unique, right? So it could, you could have many different types of pitfalls. It depends on the environment and the people you work with. Um, for me, if you want to avoid this, most of these pitfalls, right, uh, can be avoided basically if your team member, they are open to new ideas. They're open to try new things. And there's communication, basically. Then you can really avoid a lot of the, the problems that might crop up. Okay. Uh, does it answer your question? Yep. <laughs> no, no. Those are all sorts. So it's um, frameworks, pipelines, and yep. So yeah, this is this is just a small little subset. These are these are machine learning frameworks, pipelines, framework, framework, framework. Yeah. Sorry. AI framework, so um, framework is the tool that allows you to create your model. Pipeline is for you, for the end-to-end -end pipeline. Some, some, anywhere, I say, very few actually do end-to-end. -end. MLflow does try to do end-to-end. Kubeflow -end. Um, is for uh, deployment. They also have a Kubeflow pipeline for actually building of your model, your testing, uh, sorry, your matrix coming out of your testing matrix and so on. Yep. Your model accuracy, your model, the time taken to train your model, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So those are your machine training, Kubeflow pipeline, MLflow training. Yeah, those are the tools that deals with the part of the pipeline that does your training, your model training. And Kubeflow itself is for deployment. MLflow also got deployment and some others uh, that's not here, I haven't listed them. But yeah, there's a lot of tools for deployment. Serving, model serving. Sorry? Are they open source? Uh, most, these ones are open source. There's quite a few that are not open source also. Yeah, so there's a lot of tools out there. So not open source doesn't mean that um, it's expensive. Some of them are quite cheap. Yeah, and of course, there's uh, Microsoft Azure, you have Google um, ML, and then you have Facebook uh, Learner, right? Happy Learner, uh, all sorts of tools. There's a lot of platform for you to leverage off on. And this tool set is really is growing. It's just, this is only a very, very small subset. There's lots of tools for you to use. Explore them, I would say. Basically, don't reinvent the view. Python script is just um, one of the language you can use. Yeah. Uh, no, so some of these tools probably not for individual projects. So this is, uh, when we talk about Agile AI, uh, most likely it's in the context uh, of productionizing, right? Of selling your, your, your solution. 
for small projects, you probably just need to use like SKLearn, for example, or Cafe, right? Or TensorFlow, and that's enough. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Thank you very much, everybody.